The US military is preparing for the future of war against near-peer competitors like China. How are US soldiers getting ready? American Covered, I'm Chris Chappell. You know, some people say that war never changes, and to them I say, this is a battle I would love to see. Even now, war is still changing, and the US military is getting ready for the warfare of the future. Since the end of the Cold War, the US has dominated the land, sea, and air, with its military industrial complex and a logistics network that spans around the world. America has also dominated fast food secret menu items with McDonald's land, sea, and air burger. This thing is just as deadly as any military weapon. But America's military edge over the rest of the world is shrinking. Now the US has to turn its attention away from insurgents in the Middle East to near-peer competitors like China, a very different kind of warfare. The US knows China poses the biggest threat, especially through its long-range missiles and surveillance system. Even if the US maintains its military superiority over China, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has shown that even inferior forces can do significant damage, especially thanks to the use of drones and long-range missiles. The US can't guarantee that it will dominate the skies as it used to, and it could be America's turn to look up in fear of incoming threats, which would be a big change, since usually the only reason Americans look up in terror now is when they see billboards advertising a new season of The Masked Singer. Honestly, how does this garbage keep getting renewed? Anyway, the US military is gearing up to fight the warfare of the future. Here are four ways the US is preparing its conventional forces. Number one, emphasizing mobility and disbursement. Earlier this month, the US Army released its new military doctrine after five years of refinement, FM30 which stands for Field Manual. Army writers aren't exactly known for their creativity. The new doctrine is no minor thing, though. The last time the US issued an army doctrine was 40 years ago, to fight against the Soviet Union. Even George R.R. R. Martin writes sequels faster than that. Still waiting on the winds of winter, George. It's been 11 years. This latest update emphasizes what's called multi-domain operations. That's operations on land, sea, and in the air, as well as in space and cyberspace. The manual emphasizes that friendly forces must assume they are under constant observation. Things like space-based surveillance, cyber warfare, drones, or even smartphones have made detection a lot easier. The war in Ukraine has shown that military forces that stay in one place for too long are likely to be found and attacked by artillery or drones, which is why the new US military doctrine emphasizes mobility and disbursement as keys to success. In Iraq and Afghanistan, the US could afford to establish nearly permanent bases and use heavily armored tanks that sacrifice speed and range for protection against improvised explosive devices. But this strategy could leave friendly forces vulnerable to Chinese long-range missiles. That's why the military forces of the future need to be mobile. To help with that, the US military is already in the process of procuring light tanks, like the Army's Mobile Protected Firepower System. A light tank? God, now even military equipment has to watch its weight? Quit body shaming weapons of war. Hashtag tank body positivity. This would be the first new combat vehicle to enter the force in nearly four decades and most would be ready by 2035. Tank or no tank, though, dispersing US forces is another key to survival in the warfare of the future. In today's age, and tomorrow's age, it's either disperse or die in war. Disbursement makes it more difficult for enemy forces to identify and attack targets. Which is true. I learned that as a kid playing Space Invaders. The beginning of each level is always so much easier than the end when they're all spread out. On the flip side, dispersing forces also makes it a lot more difficult to coordinate friendly forces. The US Army Manual acknowledges that dispersion increases the difficulty level. That's why the US military is preparing now to get the hang of keeping all these pieces coordinated and knowing when to get them to converge for an attack. Essentially, the future of warfare is flash mobs. Man, 
War really is hell. But mobility and disbursement also lead to number two, maintaining more complex logistics. Like the U.S. Army, the U.S. Air Force is also looking to spread out its forces. Bases in Guam and Okinawa are right in the crosshairs of Chinese missiles. One way to counter that is by setting up pre-packed sets of equipment, like aircraft, fuel, weapons, and supplies, to be pre-positioned in smaller bases. The idea being that the more targets there are, the harder it will be for Chinese missiles to get them all. It's like when you play Battleship. You don't want all your ships clumped together. You gotta spread them apart. That way your opponent will have a harder time hitting you. Unless you're a cheater like my stupid cousin Rory. I know what you did, Rory. This is part of the Air Force's new Agile Combat Employment concept, or ACE. Pretty clever acronym, I know. This involves training multi-capable airmen who are able to do tasks outside their assigned specialties. For example, a security forces member would also be trained to refuel or reload aircraft, or work on communications gear at these smaller bases. It's pretty much asking for service members to learn how to do more things to reduce logistical strain. Because even in the military, your bosses ask you to do things you weren't hired to do. But on the other hand, more training is good. There's a lot that soldiers need to learn. I'll explain after the break. Welcome back. So far I've talked about the big level stuff for how the U.S. is adapting to near-peer threats like China. But as great as the vehicles, logistics, weapons, and strategies are, we need to remember what matters most is the people. Good military forces have well-trained professionals who know what they're doing. Even against overwhelming odds, individuals can do extraordinary things and change the tides of war. Again, looking at Russia's invasion of Ukraine, you can see that a military force that's not well trained can lead to a ton of disasters. Aside from the usual tasks and being able to multitask, there are some specific skills that the U.S. military wants its soldiers to learn. Starting with number three, high altitude acclimation. People watching this in Denver are probably nervous right now that they're about to be drafted. But it turns out the Pacific Ocean isn't the only place where China poses a threat. Over in the Himalayas, China and India have been at odds with each other for decades. Some, like former Indian Ambassador Rajiv Dogra, have suggested China could even attack India before Taiwan. We had him on our China Unscripted podcast talking about it. You should check it out, the link is below. If conflict were to break out between India and China, the Himalayas could be at the center of it. The problem is, it's really, really high up. The Himalayas are higher than Snoop Dogg on a giraffe in a hot air balloon. I don't want to subject our graphics guy to that picture, so just imagine it. You're welcome, Seamus. But the point is, the elevation makes it a lot harder for most people to fight, unless you're acclimatized to it like the Indian and Chinese soldiers stationed there. The U.S. would have a lot of trouble there if it were asked to help India. If unacclimatized soldiers rapidly go up to altitudes greater than 8,000 feet, they're at high risk of suffering from high altitude illness. Acute mountain sickness is common and not terribly serious, typically leaving people with headaches, nausea, and shortness of breath. But it can also lead to life-threatening illnesses, like high altitude pulmonary edema or high altitude cerebral edema, sometimes even both, which means that fluid is literally leaking out of your blood vessels into your lungs or your brain which is an embarrassing way to admit you died in battle if you wind up in Valhalla. I felled 30 men and twice as many by arrows. You? I uh, wasn't used to the elevation. <clears throat> That's why the army is studying the effects of high altitude illnesses and creating algorithms to predict acute mountain sickness. I don't know why they're going through all that trouble. All they have to do is watch the training montage from Rocky IV. Not only did it help him beat Drago, but it also ended the Cold War. Soldiers can already get training at the U.S. Army Mountain Warfare School in Vermont, but to get the real deal up in the Himalayas, the U.S. is taking part in high-altitude warfare exercises with India this month. That way they can find out who's going to get acute mountain sickness, or worse, in less dire circumstances and hopefully with access to medical care. But whether fighting high or low, there's another special skill that the U.S. wants its soldiers to learn. And that is number four, food foraging. Special Agent Trash Panda reporting for duty, sir. 
For decades, U.S. soldiers have been used to having supply chains that guarantee cafeteria food and prepackaged meals. Even remote outposts in the middle of war were largely able to rely on U.S. truck convoys or air resupplies. This could change in future wars. In the event of war, China could potentially cripple U.S. supply chains. It already has accidentally with its awful zero COVID policy, so imagine if they actually try. That's why the U.S. military is making foraging a component of light mobile logistics. The whole idea is that Marines who can forage would be less reliant on logistics. This can be done by hunting fish and pigs or by bartering with locals. If they're spread over thousands of miles and a ton of islands without U.S. superiority on their side, then they'll need to adapt to their environment on their own. This used to be very common military practice, but thanks to modern technology, it almost became a lost art. It's easy to forget that simple things like food can disappear when supply chains get messed up. With the focus on the Pacific, it may not be too long before hunting and gathering become a key part of Marine Corps entry-level training. So hunting and fishing are going to be a required part of military training? I think we're about to see a surge of enlistments from dudes that look like Larry the Cable Guy. So in short, the U.S. military is getting ready for the future of war by focusing on mobility and dispersion. It's hoping to keep its dispersed forces well coordinated and supplied in case of an attack, but soldiers need to be ready for any situation, whether on the mountains or in the middle of an island. We've come full circle. We're learning to adapt to future wars with knowledge from the past, almost like we're getting ready to be bombed into the Stone Age. Let's not uh, yabba dabba do that. So what do you think? Leave your comments below. And if you like this show, remember that we rely mainly on direct support from viewers like you. All it takes is as little as a dollar per episode over on our crowdfunding website, Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash America Uncovered for more. Click the link below. Let's get on Chris Chappell. Thanks for watching America Uncovered.